Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Kind of a surprising, maybe even ironic thing to say under the circumstances. But Lord Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. Gideon was, uh, for all intents and purposes, to put it bluntly, kind of a wimp. What's up, cool people? My name's Matt. Welcome back to our Bible study. Okay, so now we're looking at Judges chapter 6. Um, we've gone through four of Israel's judges at this point. There was Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, who was only mentioned very briefly, and then Deborah, whose rule, or I, I guess that's the best word to describe, I, whose time as judge was described in the previous two chapters. So now we're getting into a different judge named Gideon, and we'll dig into the details in this chapter and a couple of the following. But unsurprisingly, it's probably going to say, all right, well, the Israelites started worshiping other gods, they got taken over by such and such king, and then God raises up this person to be judge. And yeah, that's... It's the cycle here. Like, <laughs> none of it's really super-duper different from any other situation in terms of the broader context. Anywho. Okay. Judges chapter 6. Here we go. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes, coming with their livestock and tents, were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. So yeah, there's the... Israelites did what was evil, got handed over to the Midianites, and... Then, because of their oppression, they cry out to God for help. Which, the time frame isn't as long as was mentioned for some of the previous kings that ruled over them, or people groups that took over the land. But, uh, apparently this, the situation was more dire probably causing the people to cry out for help quicker because of how dire the situation was. Anyway, uh, verse 7. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you, bleh, I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. <laughs> uh, kind of a surprising, maybe even ironic thing to say under the circumstances, but we'll get into that in a bit. Um, so... <laughs> 
It says that the Lord sent a prophet basically telling the Israelites, hey, you're complaining to me because of your situation. Um, let me tell you why you're in this situation to begin with. You done messed up. You turned away to other gods, which I specifically told you not to do. So, after it being made clear, or at least after it was stated to the Israelites why this was happening, then God works on the uh, plan for deliverance. Basically, you know, then we get to the angel finding Gideon, who, you know, based on this heading up here, is going to become the judge who will end up freeing the Israelites eventually. And the angel says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And then we get to verse 13. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Okay, I'm going to pause there real quick. So, this verse right here kind of lays out why the whole mighty hero thing was a little bit ironic. Because... Gideon was, uh, for all intents and purposes, to put it bluntly, kind of a wimp. I mean, he says that his clan is the weakest in the whole of Manasseh, and that he's the least in his entire family. Now, least doesn't necessarily mean weakest, but it could also mean that. Um... So yeah, Gideon was not someone who you would have assumed would be called strong or mighty or anything like that. And to top it all off, he, I mean, not that he was the only one who would have done this, but he also was at the bottom of a wine press threshing wheat to to hide from the Midianites. Partially because that, you know, they would have had to hide what they were doing, otherwise the Midianites would have come and taken it away from them. But also just like, it, 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 it in general is sort of a cowardly and or weak position for someone to be in. Because if they were strong, they wouldn't need to hide that. They could, you know, fight and, you know, hold their own against anyone who would try to come and take their wheat that they're threshing. But that was not so. So, yeah. Um, God says he's going to be with Gideon anyway. Um... So, uh, then we get to Gideon's reply in verse 17. Gideon replied, If you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. He answered, I will stay here until you return. Gideon hurried home. He cooked a young goat with and with a basket of flour, he baked some bread without yeast. Then carrying the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot, he brought them out and presented them to the angel who was under the great tree. The angel of God said to him, 
Place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock, and pour the broth over it. And Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of the staff in his hand, and fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all he had brought, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. <laughs> so, I don't think Gideon quite expected that to be the sign that it was the Lord. But, I mean, that's a pretty, pretty good sign. Because you don't have people just touch stuff with a staff and have it burst into flames. Unless it's God. And then simultaneously just, like, disappear. So, he was bringing an offering. I mean, that was really just kind of a hospitable thing to do when having a guest. Um, and let me take a look at the footnote there. Hebrew says an ephah of flour, which was roughly 20 quarts or 22 liters. Um, seems like quite a bit of flour, but anyway, so he made some, I, I, I assume then that would be unleavened bread if it's without yeast. Um, but he basically, you know, pulls together what he can because again, like they didn't have much at the time with the Midianites coming and often taking a lot of what they had. So he just kind of put something together as best he could, and brought it out to give to his guest, um, who he still wasn't entirely sure was a, a representative of the Lord, but, you know, was aware of the possibility, I guess. I don't know. Brought it out and then, poof, burst in flames. And Angel disappears. So, then we get to verse 22. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he cried out, O sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. It is all right, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid. You will not die. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. The altar remains in Ophrah in the land of the clan of Abiezer to this day. The day of when this would have initially been read. Or at least written. Uh, that night the Lord said to Gideon, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Pull down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. Okay, um... So Gideon was worried that he was going to die because he saw the Lord, or actually an angel of the Lord face to face, but... Equating that with seeing God face to face, he was like, well, nobody can see the Lord's face and live. Guess I'm dead. <laughs> but then God's like, no, no, you're not going to die. He didn't say outright that it was because it was just an angel and not the Lord himself. But uh, still, God reassures him he's not going to die. So then Gideon built an altar to you know, commemorate the occasion. Probably, uh, t calling it the Lord is peace, I guess, you know, is operating under the idea of what the Lord had told him to do about, about going uh, and 
destroying the Midianites, which would have given them peace. So that so Gideon makes that altar and now God's telling him all right destroy these idols made for other gods and then build an altar to me in place of those and I want you to offer a bull as a sacrifice I'm trying to remember what kinds of offerings bulls were required for, but there were a couple of the, like, you know, sacrificial offerings mentioned prior somewhere in the the litany of laws that you get to in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and that kind of section of the Bible. Um... Would make sense in a way if that was a sin offering, but I'm not remembering offhand if that's one that required a bull. There was some offering like that that required a bull. So, it again, it would make sense to me if that was the case because then that would be like, all right, well, here's, you know, an atoning sacrifice to make up for at least my sin, me being, me, in this case, being Gideon, uh, to make up for Gideon's sin at the very least, possibly to try and show, uh, you know, an effort to atone for all of Israel. But anyway, um, so God tells him to do this stuff. And then we get to verse 27. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded. But he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Early the next morning, as the people of the town began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and that the Asherah pole beside it had been cut down. In their place, a new altar had been built, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. The people said to each other, Who did this? And after asking around and making a careful search, they learned that it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Joash. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. But Joash shouted to the mob that confronted him, Why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal, is tr if Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. From then on, Gideon was called Jerob Baal, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. So, um, I'm also realizing it doesn't say how old Gideon is here. And the fact that he was, well, I mean, family units still stuck together pretty closely for the most part. But, like, the fact that people are confronting his father about stuff that Gideon did makes me wonder if Gideon was young enough to have, you know, just because of his age, been living in his father's house still. Um, but in any case, Gideon does the things that God said, the people find out about it and try to confront Gideon's father, Joash. But both, well, definitely defending his son and also possibly kind of rebuking the people, Joash says, why are you trying to defend this God? Why Shouldn't he be able to defend himself? So, yeah, then... 
assumedly because nothing really happened to Gideon as a result of that. It also kind of, you know, gives Gideon a nickname. This whole Jerobale. Uh, looking at chat. Yeah, either Gideon was still that young or his father was that much in control or pandered to people. Yeah, I mean, his father could have been... I, I would hesitate to say that his father was deemed important in the area either. Although it, it just says his clan is the weakest in Manasseh. Not necessarily his family specifically. But in any case. Yeah, because generally uh, if he had gotten married, he would have moved into his own house and not so much been living with his father. <laughs> Is kind of the assumption I was operating under. Now that I've said my piece on those verses, um, let's move along to verse 33. Soon afterward, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east formed an alliance against Israel and crossed the Jordan, camping in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abiezer came to him. He also sent messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, summoning their warriors, and all of them responded. Okay, so... Opposing armies and peoples coming against Israel. Um, but the start of the resistance is also brewing. <laughs> Um, and I guess since nothing happened, since nothing bad happened to him from tearing down the altar of Baal and whatnot, maybe that kind of earned him a little more credit and respect among his kinfolk, or at least others who would have been living near him, which generally would have been within the same clan or at least mostly. Um, yeah, so, so those men, you know, came and joined him, um, and he also sent messengers to four other clans, and they all responded. Uh, then verse 36, then Gideon said to God, if you are truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. I will put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. And that is just what happened. When Gideon got up early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung out a whole bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Please don't be angry with me, but let me make one more request. Let me use the fleece for one more test. This time, let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is wet with dew. So that night, God did as Gideon asked. The fleece was dry in the morning, but the ground was covered with dew. As if God hadn't already kind of passed a, a test of Gideon's, doing the whole thing with, like, consuming the food offering and having the angel disappear. Gideon asked God to put dew on a fleece, but not the ground around it. And then also the next day asks the reverse of God. Like, <laughs> dude's really kind of unsure of himself. And he wants to be totally sure that God is going to take care of this. Despite being, quote-unquote, filled with power, or sorry, clothed with power by the Spirit of the Lord. Anyway, 
Um, and there will be more of Gideon in the ensuing chapters, but that is all I've got on uh, Judges chapter 6. Okay, so we have been introduced to Gideon and the circumstances surrounding his rise to, I don't want to say power or prominence, but I guess his, you know, becoming judge of Israel. Um, but there's still definitely more to go because he has just now kind of, you know, seen that God is going to make good on his promises based on the tests with the fleece thing. Um, and I guess now he's got an army with him of some sort. So it's just, it has just kind of set the stage for the possible, you know, attack against the Midianites. But anyway, as always, like and share if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel and click the bell if you're on YouTube to get updates when I post new videos. If you're seeing this over on Rumble, give me a follow there. Either way, look down in the description to get info on other social media pages and all that good stuff. And leave comments down below there with any thoughts you have. So that'll do it for now. Hope you're all doing well. Hopefully I'll see you soon for another video. But whatever the case is, till next time, stay cool people.